just last time it was some strange coincidence of upgrading Zoom version. Oh, maybe something else. That's it. Mm -hmm. Alexei, in fact, do you know if a number of a co-host is limited or not? No. No. So mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. make everybody a co-host if you uh, like. <laughs> uh, yes, but you see, it's not required. Oh, Actually, okay. I have to do for everyone manually for each one. So I will not do okay. it for all, ah, you can even do... if I need this. No. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Bianca, may I ask you already one question, not related to the talk maybe, but where did you make this very beautiful picture of these eyes? Uh, it's, it's at the shore of Lake Yuban in Canada. Ah, so, it's, so it's in Canada. It's, in Canada. it's, it's not over in mountains, it's in Canada. Some magazine of... <laughs> you no, made yourself this photo? <laughs> There was really this tree, so I guess you get this effect always if, if you have a tree at the shore. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. At least not at the White Sea, at the north of Russia, where I was once. Definitely not like that. Very interesting. Well, it's not about form, it's about form and some other structures, but still very beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit uh, hard to take a picture of a spin form, so. <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah, <laughs> as is accept. Maybe we can wait a few seconds. I uh -huh. think people are still coming. So, 
Okay. Hello, everybody. Today we have a pleasure to have a talk by Bianca Dietrich from Perimeter Institute. She will tell us about continuum limit of spin forms. Is it JR? So we will know the answer, I guess, for the end of the talk. Bianca, please, one hour. Uh, thank you, Irina, and thanks uh, to Irina, Alexei, and Luca for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to talk um, at this occasion. Uh, I will try to convey some recent results on the continuum limit of uh, spin forms. Um, so these are in particular in the last two papers here listed. And this is based on uh, developments which started with introduction of effective spin forms. Uh, in these two papers. So I will try to um, first explain a bit what are the key ingredients and key mechanisms behind spin forms. So I will be, of course, very rough. Don't uh, be surprised if you don't understand everything. You just need to tell you some essential things and then introduce shortly the effective spin forms um, to present basically the results on the continuum limit. Um, of course, we have to do some approximation here to say to be able to say something. And interestingly, we can, however, derive uh, the same result um, from directly the continuum and uh, a continuum action. Okay. So, what are spin forms? So, in general, these are path integrals for gravity. And they are based on a particular formulation of gravity, which is a Plibansky formulation, um, which has grown out uh, from the 70s. And um, one particular um, thing here is that this is really to be a, a real quantum mechanical path integral, meaning we do not use a cleaving quantum gravity. We really have an eye in the action. Um, that makes things much more complicated because it's in general very hard to compute such path integrals. And so, um, well, in the Plebansky actions, I will I will explain that in a minute. We will have a number of fields, and in some sense, you can understand um, the particulars of spin forms from the order in which you do this integrating uh, out the, the fields in the path integral. So uh, that will end up in a certain quantization scheme. This quantization scheme is actually on the kinematical level shared with one of topological field theory. And the nice thing about topological field theories, these can be quantized and regularized and so on exactly. So they usually are regular, regular, regulator independent. Um, and provide you a complete quantum theory, which actually is also tachymorphism variant in the end. And so that is uh, a lot used in the spin form construction. The same quantum objects or quantum quantization techniques actually appear in loop quantum gravity. And so the quantum geometry, which you have in spin forms and the one which you get in loop quantum gravity are actually the same. And uh, if you know lattice gauge theory, so basically the path integral in lattice gauge theory, that will have the same kinematical structures uh, as the ones appearing here. Um, okay, so these spin forms, you know, are around since uh, the late 90s. So there have, of course, many people been contributing. Um, and I forgot, of course, to list many additional people. Um, and I, I won't be able to, to list everyone everywhere. So um, just to give you a short introduction um, for more details, one source would be the living reviews by uh, Alejandro Perez in 2013. I will start to just describe what is actually the Plebansky formulation and what's the field theory underlying spin forms. And so the first, Thing I want to remind you of is, uh, is a Palatini action in the first order form. So where we have tetrads um, and an independent spin connection. 
And so this formulation classically is in principle equivalent to GR. Um, and so we won't need the details. So we have a curvature form and these co-tetrads variables. What we also do is to add the so-called holds term. So this is a term which is added to the action, but does not change the classical equations of motion. And that introduces also this parameter called the barbero mizi parameter. It's kind of um, analogous to the, to the theta term in QCD. And it's introduced so that um, the, the canonical momenta, which you get by directly uh, looking at the action, so that you know, part of the canonical variables you get agree with the Ashtika Barbero connection. And so if you don't do that, you don't get the Ashtika Barbero connection, you, go more, you, you get more directly just the extrinsic curvature, which is not the connection. But you want to aim at the gauge formulation. And so for that, you want to add a connection to this extrinsic curvature so that you can basically integrate this connection to holonomy and so on, and in the end, get something similar to lattice gauge theory. Okay, so just adding this uh, term, which does not change the classical equation of motion. And now we come finally to the Plebansky formulation. So what is happening here is, in some sense, is a redefinition. Um, this term in front of the curvature here, this hot star E wedge E is replaced by an independent field. So this is a Lie algebra valued two form in the end, the B field. And if you look here, B wedge F is also the kinetical term appearing in Young Mills. That B field will be turning out to be uh, the canonical momentum conjugated to the Ashley Cabrero connection. And of course, now well, you have introduced, uh, replaced this E wedge E field, uh, but to get back gravity, you would need to impose constraints. And these are known as simplicity constraints, which restrict this B field to be given to be of the form again, hot star E wedge E. Um, so in general, you can have much more general two forms um, than, than of this form. And in fact, if you allow these more general forms, so the theory you get here, you probably know that as B wedge F, but even in this more generalized form, it's still just a BF theory, which is topological in nature. So it has so many gauge symmetries that there's no propagating degrees of freedom left. And so that's the formulation on which uh, spin forms are used. And so the kind of advantage of using that is that the topological nature of this underlying BF theory allows an exact quantization um, via the path integral. And uh, the spin form approach uses this exact quantization and then imposes a quantum version of the simplicity constraints to obtain a quantized version of general relativity. So that's a spin form strategy. Um, let me again give you a very rough inter, uh, overview of, of what kind of form of path integral you get. So um, let's just start with actually the BF theory. So here I just uh, have rewritten it in a, in a little form that makes it more obvious that well, this action is just linear in B. So these B fields uh, act as Lagrange multipliers and just enforce that the curvature has to vanish. So if you just formally imagine you integrate out over these B fields, what you get is uh, from this oscillating factor, just the de delta function. So your path integral is actually integral over flat connections. And if you regularize that by a discretization, you replace uh, or you integrate the connection to holonomies along edges in your discretization. And you can write that in this, in this form, which is kind of very similar to lattice gauge theory. 
just that you impose that each um, closed holonomy, so all the Wilson loops, uh, should be trivial. So the one technical trick which then appears is, uh, and, and again, you can in principle also do that for lattice gauge theory, you do a variable transformation, which is based on uh, a technique known as group Fourier transform. So functions on the group are expanded into, um, into representations, representation matrices, and then you can integrate out all the group elements and the representation matrices, all these uh, representation, representation matrices then collapse into um, recoupling symbols. And so they organize them on this, on this discretization. If you use a triangulation, they, they can be organized as being, uh, as having one recoupling symbol associated to each four simplex. And these recoupling symbols, uh, they are just generalization of the, of the 6 J symbol for SU2, which you have um, for, which you can actually associate with tetrahedra. So here we have four simplices. You get so-called 15 J symbols, where J would be an SO4 representation. And so what we already have here is basically a so-called state sum, a spin form state sum, because that's the spin form representation of BF of the BF pass integral. And the spin is just comes, this language comes from using these spin representations. I mean, spin representation for SU2. SU4 is just actually two labels of uh, SU2 representations. I mentioned that this is a topological field theory. So this result here, this partition function, is independent of, of the chosen triangulation. And it already comes with a geometric interpretation. So the four simplex uh, has 10 triangles and five tetrahedra. And in fact, there's 15 Js distributed into 10 kind of J representation labels, which are associated to the 10 triangles. And they actually encode the Casimir of this representation. And the Casimir is basically given by the uh, inner product between uh, the, the B field of the B field associated to, to the triangle. And later on, this will indeed give you the value of the area square operator for triangles. Um, and this is as a four, so that we will get this spectra for, for the areas. There are furthermore, basically, uh, la representation labels, which are, however, to be read as intertwiners in this recoupling scheme associated to tetrahedra. And they encode basically information about the inner products between two uh, B fields. So that is basically very equivalent to looking at, at the inner pro product between two as the two generators in your recoupling scheme. And these happen to um, represent, to encode the quantum shape of tetrahedra. I here say quantum shape um, because we have only one quantum parameter, whereas for a tetrahedron, um, we have four areas and two angles to parameterize the full geometry of a tetrahedron, because it has six, six, six edges and so six lengths. And so in principle, we would need two parameters to classically fully parameterize the tetrahedron if we have given these four areas. But it turns out, in fact, that these two parameters are not commuting. And that really arises from having the geometry encoded in these B fields, which turn out to be quantized as generators, uh, Lie algebra generators uh, of a non abelian group. And so um, well, this is just the usual non commutativity of your angular momentum, which shows up here. And you get basically just one parameter. Uh, in, the, in the quantum theory representing a conjugated pair of variables. Interestingly, you know, this, this phase space you get or this quantization you get is underlying a phase space 
which has been derived in mathematics and is known as Karpovich Milson phase space. So you, you get these results via different means. Okay, so this gives you, this is just the topological um, field theory, which we have quantized here. And what we now have to do is uh, impose the simplicity constraints into the quantum theory. Um, so that is a very lengthy discussions, which, you know, these models, uh, the first ones have been constructed in 2007. Um, and so I will summarize it just in, in this information that the simplicity constraints um, fall into two sets. And what, the first set you can impose sharply. And that is happening by restricting the representation labels of SO4. Uh, and SO4 is, is kind of almost equivalent to SE2 cross SE2 to a particular form. Um, which is given here in terms of these as the two representation labels, uh, small j. And so these j's has, have to be connected um, by this kind of uh, left label has to be connected with the right label to be of this form where this barbero music parameter appears. Then there are so-called weakly imposed constraints. And these are imposed in a, in a more complicated form. You insert coherent states for the intertwiner labels. And well, these coherent states are the Lomov states for SU2. And these will be peaked on classical shapes of tetrahedra as determined by the triangles of the areas in a given simplex. So you might rightly ask why weakly imposed constraints? And well, that's due to this non commutativity I mentioned due to the fact that we have quantum tetrahedra and not classical tetrahedra. So these, this set of constraints is in fact uh, non-commuting and you can, uh, you, you get actually an anomaly. So it's technically as a constraint set, it's second class. Um, so you cannot impose them sharply due to the uncertainty uh, relations. And that's why you impose them only weakly. And one way to do that is to use these coherent states. This anomaly and the commutator turns out to be proportional to the gamma parameter. I mean, this kind of has a more complicated form, but it's important that this barbero mesi parameter appears. Um, so this barbero mesi parameter is actually an anomaly parameter. And it controls how sharply we can impose these constraints. And therefore, it controls the quantum fluctuations away from um, consistent length configurations. So I, uh, you can look up the exact form of the spin form amplitudes. Uh, it's kind of uh, even more complicated contractions starting with the BF uh, Greek coupling symbols, but then, you know, there's kind of these coherent states coming in. And uh, in the end, the spin forms have a form, which is usually presented as the sum over the spins. And the amplitudes are given by a huge product over all simplices. And you have basically this so-called uh, simplex amplitude associated over each simplex. And so this is kind of a local form of the, of the spin form amplitudes. It factorizes over these four simple states. Well, this has kind of the nice feature uh, that it rigorously implements the quantum geometry notion coming from loop continuity. But unfortunately, already the one simplex amplitude is extremely expensive to compute. Um, there have been kind of now, Recently, since around 2018, cons well, cons uh, uh, research program to um, provide really computer programs to compute these uh, amplitudes, but it's really hard to do larger scale computations. What has been going on sh since shortly after these models were constructed is to analyze the semi-classical limit meaning 
that you send h bar going to zero, and I will call that naive semi-classical limit for reasons you will see soon. And that reproduces a geometric action, which I will explain um, later on. But this semi-classical limit, these works also indicated that curved configurations are suppressed. And that has been become known as so-called flatness problem. And well, that, you know, the first indications we was were already seen in, in this first semi-classical analysis. So, and then uh, it started in these works. And later on, it was also confirmed numerically that this seems to be the case. And it has been around since quite some time. And so in particular to, to, to clarify that, but also to really get a model where we can actually compute much more nicely these amplitudes and the path integral, well, we constructed the so-called effective spin forms. And um, by the, the one step we take is that we had these intertwiner labels, which encodes the tetrahedral shapes, and these we integrate out. Um, and that introduces, again, constraints, which are weakly imposed. So in terms of Gaussian factors, and these will couple the neighboring simplices. Um, so simplices which share a tetrahedron. And so one part of our partition function will be given by these Gaussian factors. And these constraints, what they ensure is that you can actually consistently compute the lengths from the areas. If you identify two simplices, a given simplex has, has 10 areas. If you identify two simplices, um, you have to identify the four shared areas um, of the tetrahedron. So you get 16 areas. But at the same time, you have only 14 lengths because the same tetrahedron has six lengths. So you subtract that from 20. So you have less lengths than areas. So to compute consistently the lengths, you need to impose constraints. These are the area length constraints. And these are the constraints which are weakly imposed basically by these Gaussian factors. Um, we further use more directly this geometric action, uh, which is actually the so-called area ratio action, which again, I will explain later more in detail. It comes by, you know, for configurations which agree uh, where, the area where the area length constraints are satisfied. It gives you the length ratio action, which agrees with a discretization of, uh, which gives you a discretization of the Einstein-Hilbert action. And so um, there is amplitudes will be given by a mixture of the usual oscillating factor with the action, but also these uh, Gaussian factors imposing these area length constraints. Um, okay, so the spread of, of these Gaussian factors is completely determined by this non-commutativity I mentioned before. So let me just uh, make a few remarks on the structure uh, of these effective spin forms. So I've seen BF theory comes from a recoupling sim symbol from uh, gauge theory. And in the same way, you can construct this in principle from higher gauge theory. And actually this action is, is coming from a recoupling sim symbol of this higher gauge theory and turns out to have a simpler form. Um, here we have a much more transparent encoding of the dynamics because we see directly this geometric action and basically these constraints in terms of the Gaussian factors. Well, and it's much more amenable to numerical investigations, which we have already used. So computations which for full spin forms take weeks or months uh, on, on high performance computers take kind of seconds on a laptop. Um, one big reason is that we already got rid of many of the variables uh, given by the intertwiners, which you still have to do deal with in the in the full spin form models. Okay, 
So let me explain where this flatness problem basically comes from. So um, I mentioned that you have this oscillating factor and these Gaussian factors, uh, which implement weakly the constraints. And so this issue with the semi-classical limit is actually something very general, which will always happen if you impose second class constraints um, in, in this way. Uh, so you have your oscillating factor and you want to restrict, however, the configurations by using these Gaussians. And the issue is if you, uh, well, if you, if you decrease H bar, your oscillations will become stronger and stronger, uh, whereas the width of the Gaussian also decreases, but it does so only with the square root of H bar. So in the end, if you send H bar to zero, the oscillations will win and in some sense wash out these Gaussians. And so uh, what will happen is that basically this oscillating factor will dominate and you just get uh, stationary points in the end of your action. Um, so this flatness problem is actually, should be actually called an anom anomaly problem. Uh, so for the proper semi-classical regime should be uh, identified or should have an additional condition which restricts the number of oscillations over the width of the Gaussian to, to be small, like in this case. And so this, what I've written here is just the ratio of the variation of the action and the width of this Gaussian as given by um, the anomaly or the non-commutator in, uh, in, in, in the constraint algebra. And this has to be uh, smaller than uh, of order one. And in particular, you see that the Barbero and Easy parameter appears here, which indeed controls how sharply we can uh, uh, impose the constraints. So in particular, we see that, that gamma has to be small, but it appears also with further um, parameters here, which you can in principle control by your boundary data. So that's for one, the areas. So, um, and the variation of the action, uh, that is actually proportional to the curvature as you see, or to the curvature angle. So gamma has to be small, but you can, of course, ask how small, because in principle, well, gamma has to go to zero um, if H bar goes to zero. Um, but to, to check that, we, in fact, did the, using the effective spin forms, did the first computation of expectation values for the effective spin forms. Um, and we did it for a triangulation, which tests really the equation of motion. Um, here you see basically a result of these expectation values as a function of gamma. Uh, the different colors indicate um, different boundary values. So it's that's a scaling of the boundary. You see basically an almost flat line and that's a good result because that's the expectation value divided by the classical uh, value, which you get by solving the classical equation of motion. So for a certain range of gamma up to, well, say 0 0.5, you know, you find or, well, very consistently as an expectation value, the classical result. Uh, but then you get small oscillations starting with gamma equal to 0 0.6, and then it becomes completely useless, so to say, if gamma goes beyond one. So in particular here, we say that uh, gamma equal to zero one is very safe and is a reasonable range um, for, for the Barbero uh, Emirzi parameter. But we have looked at much, at, at much more examples than the one I presented here. And so gamma equal to 0 0.1 seems to be a reasonable regime um, for a certain range of curvature we tested and the uh, sizes we tested. But we also see that we get actually a larger 
range of possible gammas than we expected from this inequality. So in particular here, you see that, that uh, the area appears. So to satisfy this inequality, you would expect that only small areas are allowed. But in this case, where we use kind of a very small curvature angle, we also see that uh, it, the results get actually more stable with larger areas. So that's one of the unexpected results we see here. So to summarize, well, we, we have shown and uh, that's been from Stu reproduced the discretized gravitational dynamics. That has been basically in question because of the flatness problem I mentioned. Gamma has to be small. It's not a completely free parameters in relation to other dynamical parameters. And that's no surprise because it is actually an anomaly parameter. But you can ask what about the continuum uh, limit? So this continuum limit, I mean to use actually many, many building blocks. Um, so it's rather a refinement limit because in, in these computations, you know, we use really lengths or areas as variables. So the scale is really encoded as, an, as a dynamical variable. But here we mean that we use really uh, lots of building blocks. And so that I will explain next. And the surprise is actually, um, given that we kind of worried for a long time about these constraints and the weak imposition of the constraints, it turns out that the continuum limit provides a mechanism to suppress these area length constraints without any explicit constraint impl implementation. So in principle, we don't even need to go through, the, through this weak imposition of, of the area length constraints. To explain that, well, I will, and, and that comes really from the dynamics of this area Ratchet action. And so I will, uh, spend a few minutes just to present the area Ratchet action and uh, present the results on this continuum limit of the area Ratchet action. Uh, any questions so far? Um, hi, Bianca. Uh, yeah. I have a question. So uh, when you say that there is a, a, a flatness problem, uh, what, what exactly does that mean that uh, any, any any fluctuations around the flat metric are are not allowed. Um, well, it, it has always been. Um, that if you if you take h bar to just h bar to zero, um, hmm. then indeed the claim is, and you can kind of show that mathematically, that the partition function will be more and more concentrated on configurations which which are flat. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's it scales so this this sharpness scales with um with each with each bar. Mm -hmm. um, we have actually explicit plots of this effect um in, in this paper. Okay. Um. Uh, Again, you know, here in this computation, we of course don't take h bar completely to zero. H bar is h bar, um, and well, you know, what 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 you are actually interested is in is is the ratio between basically the area and h bar that really leads to uh, the spin labels, which label the areas, and so uh, sending h bar to zero means roughly that you use, that you go to infinite, infinitely large spin. Um, okay. And of course, we always use finite spin in the end. Uh, so the classical limit, you would go more and more classical uh, with using larger and larger spins. That's why we tested here uh, different, different sizes for the boundary values here. Um, we actually see that in this example, it actually gets better. And um, this sending h bar to zero. Okay. Um, um, just a quick, yeah. quick follow up. Uh, so first of all, I mean, even if even if the flat solution was the dominant solution, isn't that isn't that natural and to be expected? I mean, I mean, isn't that 
uh, like in some sense, just the ground state of 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 uh, for quantum but, gravity. And and the second uh, thing, I sure. I mean, getting the flat solution is in in, in some sense. Uh, a good thing, but this, I mean, you know, it has been debate, debated for a long time in the in the uh, literature, because of course you want to allow for also curved solutions to get mm. curvature. Um, and in fact, one argument is that, that this is not too bad, is that well, in your discretization, in the end, you want to get to a continuum limit, so actually the curvature angle should be should be quite small. So in fact, mm -hmm. the, the relevant regime is that you want to have small curvature angles. Um, but again, you know, it's really in this explicit computation, um, you see that for instance, you cannot choose gamma to be uh, arbitrarily large um, if, you, if you do use finite spins, which are quite large. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you do these computations for uh, well, for for larger curvature for lambda equal to a uh, thousand, um, and you have some examples where you use larger curvature, then it really uh, happens that these very strong oscillations already start at gamma at values for gamma which are zero point two or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go on because in fact, sure, 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 sure. Um, but you can ask what happens in the continuum limit. And, and in fact, I will tell you that in the continuum limit, it seems that we do not need to impose uh, these, these constraints at all because they are imposed by the dynamics of the system automatically. Um, and so in fact, there's kind of two independent resolutions if you want to the flatness problem. One is that we do get uh, uh, the right dynamics uh, on a discretized level if we kind of choose gamma to be sufficiently small, but the second one is actually also the continuum limit. Um, and so uh, let me just say a few words about the length, about the Ratchet action. And so here I use it in, in two versions, which are however encoding quite a different dynamics in principle. So the Ratchet action is is a very nice discretization of the Einstein-Hilbert action, which um, was proposed by Reggie quite some time ago. You use the triangulation, your variables are the lengths of the edges. And then this, so that means that all the um, geometry, geometric data and your triangulations are uniquely determined. Um, and you compute an action which depends on, on these lengths in your triangulation. Um, so you this is a discretization of the Einstein-Hilbert term, so the uh, Ricci scalar times the square root of the determinant of the, of the uh, matrix. So here you have these curvature angles, and um, these curvature angles give you basically the value of the Ricci scalar, but these are distributionally focused on the triangles. And so that's why you multiply basically these curvature angles with the uh, areas of your triangles. And if you vary this action with respect to the length, so I should add that this aut automatic, uh, no. Uh, anyway, if you vary this action with respect to the length, you do get the equations of motion, um, which present a discretization of the uh, Einstein equations. In particular, you don't see that epsilon has to be zero, of course, here. Now the area Ratchet action is defined in a way so that if, if, the, if the area configuration comes from a length configuration, then it completely agrees with the values of the length Ratchet action. But you have actually more areas than lengths, so you will have many area configurations which come not from a consistent length uh, assignment to the edges. And in that case is something more general, which you however can still explicitly construct. So that's why I put a tilde over this uh, curvature angle. So it's construct kind of a very similar way to the to this curvature angle depending on the length. But if you 
put everything together, it gives you basically also a definition um, on how this function behaves if you go away from these consistent length configuration. If you now vary the equations of motion, so what, what happens because of a certain identity known as Schlieffler identity is that in fact, well, you know, A's, the areas again, act as a kind of Lagrange um, multiplier and you impose that these epsilon tildes are equal to zero. So that looks very much like the flattens problem because in that case, uh, these curvature angles give you curvature. But in fact, I'm calling that pseudo flatness because in, that, in, in the case of array Regi calculus, these quantities encode not only curvature, um, but also the also this, this fact that area um, configurations are more general than length configurations. So they encode kind of degrees of freedom, which in the end uh, tell you that for instance, the shape of tetrahedra um, do not need to match if you compute that from different simplices. Okay, so well, this area action, area reg action is the thing which appears in the semi classical limit of, um, of spin forms. And quite early, it was noted that well, spin forms do seem to appear more or less as quantization of the area reg action. But also, there's an obvious problem, which seems that, well, you do get this pseudo flatness. And so it was usually thought very widely that this does not lead to a suitable dynamics and in particular does not lead to GR. And so the first step to see what it actually leads to in the continuum limit, limit will be for us to um, analyze the array reaction action on an infinitely large triangulation so to be able to do that, we will linearize the area reaction action around a flat configuration. Um, so uh, describing a reg regular hypercubical lattice with arbitrary many cells and doing so, in particular using a regular lattice allows us to use the lattice Fourier transform. And that's just important to see how various terms in the action scale um, with the momenta of defined by the lattice Fourier transform. And in particular, it will say us which degrees of freedom are massless and which have a basically mass. And this mass typically scales with the lattice constant. And so these will be the degrees of freedom which kind of do not survive in the continuum limit. And so basically one has to compute the linearized area Regi action, so the hashing of the area Regi action and be uh, well intelligent on, on how to uh, find and identify the massless and ma massive modes. And this has been done for the length Regi action a long time ago by, by Ruth Williams and Martin Rocek. Back then there was a discussion whether actually length Regi calculus leads to GR. And well, that's, they identified the two graviton modes correctly. Um, but for a long time, uh, well, by, I, I know of one attempt by, by uh, Bruce Williams around 2004-05, where she tried to analyze uh, area Regi calculus on, on a hypercubic lattice, comes with particular issues, but back then it turned out to be a bit too complicated yet. Um, but we managed to do that. Um, so of course we use algebraic method. I mean, we use uh, Mathematica to do that. It's, it's a bit uh, hard to do that by hand. And that turns out to be really the first analysis of, of a linearized area Regi action on a hypercubic lattice. Actually, we use two different lattices and these two different publications. The second one uh, is centrally subdivided. So you add even more variables to your problem, but it turns out that this leads to a much nicer result and it allows us to identify the continuum re, um, limit. So the crucial step here, which is a bit subtle, is really to find 
um, a splitting of the variables and to identify the variables which really contribute to the continuum limit. And that is determined by finding homogeneous scalings, so blocks in your hashing which homogeneously scale uh, in, in the derivatives that is in your Fourier uh, momenta. And well, sometimes or quite often, generically, you would have to really do variable transformations to find these nice blocks. And so what we find uh, in particular that we identified the two sets of variables leading to the two leading orders in the continuum limit, and these form the area matrix. So the area matrix is a generalization of the length matrix. The length matrix gives you the length of tangent vectors and angles in between these lengths, the tangent vectors. The area matrix gives you well, the areas of parallelograms and the dihedral angles between the planes. It has, it has 20 components, so that's very similar to the Riemann tensor, and that will be important at some point. And as a, for the Riemann tensor, you can kind of take the trace part, uh, so corresponding to the Ritchie, part, Ritchie tensor and Ritchie scalar. And if you take the trace part, you get the length matrix and the traceless, the trace-free part corresponding to the Weil tensor for the Riemann tensor gives you 10 additional components, which I will call chi. So this is for the linearized area matrix. And they basically um, parameterize your deviation from a consistent length matrix. Um, so we have more degrees of freedom, but they, if you integrate them out, they only contribute to even higher order in the continuum limit. Uh, let me mention that area matrix have been discussed uh, around 2006 by um, Schuller and Wolfhard, and they proposed, uh, they, they motivated that from, from a number of approaches, including string theory, um, and proposed certain actions, which will, however, not agree with the actions we, we find here. So I, I, I you are invited to, to look at the papers. I won't present the calculations. Um, you know, it's, it's huge matrices we have to deal with. Um, so I mentioned that basically in the end, we deal with, uh, with the area matrix degrees of freedom. They split into the length matrix and additional, these additional chi degrees of freedom. If you look at the Hessian block in the length matrix, well, that gives us basically linearization of, of the uh, length Ritchie action. And so it gives us a discretized linearized Einstein-Hilbert action. And that in the end is indeed zeros order and the lattice constant. So that's the term which survives the, the limit if you send lambda completely to zero. And well, as you know, second order in derivatives. So the scaling in derivatives you know, can be in principle replaced with the scaling of lambda. Um, so the larger lambda is the more derivatives you have. So what we then have to also do is to integrate out the chi degrees of freedom. And that is a linearized theory. So in the end, you get basically an effective Hessian, which is given by your GR block, so to say. And um, you get a correction. And so th this correction is determined from these non-diagonal blocks and the inverse of the diagonal blocks. So then for this correction, which I put in quotation marks because it's not clear yet that this is actually subdominant, you would need to uh, determine the scaling in lambda to see what, what uh, whether how it contributes to the continuum limit. And so there, you could have in principle a range of possibilities. Um, one possibility is that we have the following scaling in these in these Hessian blocks. And in that case, you know, so um, lambda to the zero means you have second order derivatives, but these uh, lambda minus to two scaling means that these are, that the leading terms are zeros order in the derivative. Um, and in that case, your correction would dominate. So in the end, it would scale with the inverse square of the uh, lattice constant. And it would mean that spin forms would not lead to a suitable 
continuum limit because you would rather have this correction dominating over GR. Another possibility is that you find just this homogeneous scaling. So all blocks are second order in derivatives. So all blocks are also describing massless degrees of freedom. Uh, in that case, the uh, correction would scale at the same order as GR. And that would mean that you need to impose the constraints at least weekly to, to see um, GR emerging in the continuum limit. There's the third correction, the third possibility, and now I give away the surprise, which actually happens, is that you have the scaling. And so that scaling means that you get a quadratic term in the chi's uh, of zeros order and derivatives. So you get a mass term. And uh, whereas all the other terms are quadratic and derivatives. And so that means that the correction will scale with the lattice can constant square and be of higher order, uh, be suppressed in the continuum limit. So the GR term uh, survives and we can properly understand this as a higher order correction. Um, and so that happens even without any constraint implementation, if you do impose the constraints weekly, it will not change um, this result. So the constraint terms will just add further mass, uh, for, uh, another mass term um, in this Kai Kai block. Okay. So we basic we do find that very surprisingly, area Reche. Also, the equation of motions look very different than the ones of length Ratchet. In the continuum limit, it has the same continuum limit if you really send lambda to zero as length Ratchet. And the mechanism is really that all the additional degrees of freedom which we have here, so in particular, we, we have uh, the, the uh, chi degrees of freedom, which are 10 in addition to the metric, but then we have even more degrees of freedom, which I haven't discussed here in detail, which contribute to higher order. All these degrees of freedom basically get, get a mass um, of, of the scale of the lattice, uh, lattice constant. And then we, we went farther than just the scaling argument. Um, what we can also identify is the terms in the Hessian. If you look basically at these two blocks, uh, the diagonal block um, and this first non-diagonal block, it turns out that it describes you a discretization of the Riemann tensor. So these epsilons just indicate a, a dualization. And if you contract this Riemann tensor, you know, it has 20 components, but if you take the proper co contraction um, from the other side, you do get your Einstein-Hilbert term. Um, and if you project out all the trace degrees of freedom, well, you get the Weyl term. And so that's the reason why the correction, we know that the correction gives you really the Weyl square term and its fourth order in derivatives compared to, to the GR term, which is second order in derivatives. Plus we have a higher order. So, well, as, as I mentioned, the, the, the surprise, which I think uh, nobody really expected, is that every Reggie calculus in the continuum limit really um, gives length Reggie calculus. The mechanism is that it's only the metric degrees of freedom which, which turn out to be massless. Everything else will get basically. Um, a mass corresponding to the lattice scale, which we imagine to send to the, to the Planck scale. Um, for that, we do not need any explicit constraint implementation. And even if you do so, the results will, will not change in an essential way. Um, that is a very positive result, uh, well, um, feature. It shows um, the, the universality in the sense that there's actually a range of spin-form models and these spin-form models differ 
in how exactly the constraints are implemented. It's this kind of weak implementation. And so how you basically precisely implement the constraints, there's a certain uh, by a range of possibilities. As you know, there's also a range of possibilities to define coherent states. So you roughly can, can understand the ambiguities from there. But these details do not seem to matter in the continuum limit. And well, in the last five minutes, so that is basically this, this statement or the finding concerning uh, the continuum limit. Of course, what we basically use is, is a kind of uh, background, background field method. So we used, uh, we assumed that we can actually apply um, this method and look at the linearization and that this tells us something about the dynamics of the excitation on top of a flat background. Um, but uh, in the last five minutes, I will um, discuss shortly whether there's an alternative way to understand this result. So here we have taken a route which you know starts from the Plebansky formulation for GR, goes through spin form quantization, which imposes part of these constraints which appear in the Plebansky formulation weekly. Um, then one can take the same classical limit to get the area Ratchet action. And we have looked at the um, continuum limit for the area Ratchet action. So the question is, what happens if you directly take the continuum action for the Plebansky formulation and somehow impose the simplicity constraints there only weakly? Do you get the same result? Um, well, the final answer will be, will be yes. Uh, so let me kind of explain how that comes about. Uh, it, you can start with a framework which was uh, called modified Klebanski action. Um, and that was proposed by Kirill Krasnov uh, some years ago. The idea is to replace the simplicity constraints with a steep potential. So to very similar to what I described in the case of the area Ratchi action. You make uh, degrees of freedom which correspond to the simplicity constraints very heavy. Um, and Kirill's hope back then was that this renormalization flow uh, for these actions um, would turn out to be just the flow of, of the potential. Um, if you do that for basically the generalized uh, or the general Plebansky action, um, it leads to a biometric theory, and you have additional auxiliary fields which are usually integrated out. Uh, so the biometric theory well has two matrices, um, so it's not really GR. To determine from this Plebansky action, um, you might remember from the beginning of the talk, the Plebansky action has an independent connection and Lagrange multiplier fields and the B fields. So you start out to integrate out the connection and the Lagrange multiplier fields, which now are actually not Lagrange multipliers because they, uh, you have replaced these constraints with, with the potential. And that leads us to uh, a second order action for the B fields only. And what you then use is a parametrization of the B fields um, by uh, a set of, of other variables. And this set of variables is given by uh, two independent matrix, uh, which I called here G plus and G minus. So these are uh, length matrix and additionally auxiliary um, matrix, uh, which I called here Q plus and Q minus. So they are internal SE2 matrix. And these additional degrees of freedom, their number is 10. Uh, here I have another 10 plus 10. So overall you have 30 degrees of freedom. The simplicity constraints expressed in these new fields say that you want to set these two matrix to be equal and that all these additional auxiliary fields should be also just given by identity matrices. So in the end, you are just left with one matrix. Uh, so what we have to choose is to well, say which of these simplicity constraints we impose weakly and which we impose sharply. And 
what we want to reproduce is effective action from the area Redshake calculus and also the area metric as a free variable. And so we, what we do is to choose these metric, the two metrics to be exactly equal, but this auxiliary fields, we allow fluctuation, fluctuations around the identity. And that in fact leads exactly to an area metric. And we can compute the linearized action again. It um, is very near the GR action uh, with respect to basically um, a funny variable transformation of your, of your matrix. But you also have these mass terms. So that comes from um, encoding the simplicity constraints in these potentials. So you have these two mass terms. And so you can integrate out these uh, auxiliary fields and you find an effective action, which is the linearized GR action plus a wild square term. Um, the wild square term comes you know, with this factor where you see uh, an inverse Laplacian or box operator appearing here but uh, this is kind of suppressed, this non-locality by these mass parameters, which here we freely choose. So that's a parameter, a free parameter in your potential, which we choose. So this particular form of, of the wild square term turns out to be uh, ghost free. Um, and you would basically have in principle dependence on the barbero music parameter um, by choosing these mass parameters to be the kind of some function of the Barbero and Misi parameter. And so well, that result is compatible what we found with in the case of Ariarache calculus. Well, there I said you get a wild square term, but in fact, if you just expand this into the derivatives, then what you will find is just higher order corrections, um, which we didn't determine in the case of, of the lattice. And so, well, that is uh, a positive result because we find the same result from directly in the continuum. Um, and well, you can understand the wild square term really from having the area uh, metric uh, and the wild square, the wild term comes really from these trace free degrees of freedom. So the interesting question is, are there universality arguments for our area metric actions? I mentioned the kind of different uh, that uh, such actions were proposed uh, a few years back, but in fact, these actions are very involved and uh, do not give mass to all these additional degrees of freedom. So it's not clear to me that they actually lead to GR. But overall, that's a new opportunity for the well, phenomenology in general, in particular for spin form phenomenology. You have now a precise proposal for um, a continuum action being motivated from, from spin forms. In particular, it's motivated from this quantization and the anomaly we find, and this anomaly leads to this extension uh, from the length metric to the area metric. And so that in the end leads to basically Planck scale degrees of freedom, um, which which come from the area metric. As the last remark. Excuse me, Janka, uh, please yeah. try to uh, conclude yeah. in a few minutes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so so this okay, was you. this was perturbative. Of course, there's much more work to be done uh, to show that, that the pass integral exists non-perturbatively. Um but there's there's ideas around that goes under the general problem of computing um, proper Lorentzian pass integrals. Again, effective spin form models will be helpful in that they are much more numerically um, accessible. And well, let me summarize, uh, I think in, in, in three sentences. Well, spin form quantization leads to this interesting picture that Quantum geometry um, describes an extended configuration space. Technically, that is explained by having an anomaly in the simplicity constraint algebra. Um, 
But in the continuum limit, we find that there's an automatic mechanism that suppresses these additional degrees of freedom. And we can describe that directly in the continuum limit, uh, in the continuum theory, via this modified Plebansky approach. In the end, we get a non-local version of einstein weil gravity. Uh, thank you. Okay. Sorry for being. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Questions, please. Yes, Ruka, please ask your question. Uh, thanks, Bianca, for the talk. Uh, I have a question regarding the no local action that you showed in the uh, almost at the end. This uh, no local. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, Can you show uh, it again? Okay, yes. So, I mean, uh, I mean, first is just, uh, yeah, I have two questions. So, first, is this operator like just in front of a square or is it between the two vials, like a vial operator vial? Um, I mean, we've, we've wrote it in, 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 in Fourier components, so uh, yeah, I guess you can you can put it in the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay, you know, and yeah, because I mean, so usually, of course, as you said, also usually the byte square introduce ghost in the theory. And you are saying that this Lagrange is ghost free. So there should be no uh, problem with, um, let's say, uh, let's say negative sign that can create a problem of unitarity and instabilities. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, but if you look at here, at this, at this dispersion relation, mm -hmm. it's, it's ghost free. So you don't have a negative sign. Um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make uh, the propagator more convergent. <laughs> um, I mean, you would expect in principle um, uh, more problems in, in uh, for divergencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so what happens okay. is, is you, you don't put a k to the four, which you know then the dispersion relation goes to be to be negative again, goes down again. Um, mm -hmm. What happens is that instead of uh, k squared, uh, it goes for higher momenta. It 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 changes into approaching um, a maximum momentum. So there's mm -hmm. uh, a maximum value for uh, so. If I try to show that with a mouse, it looks like this. <laughs> if you can imagine that. Anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's ghost free in, at least in this linearization. So that's what we checked. Okay. Um, so of course, it's a question to, to extend that in, to nonlinear order, which we could do in principle, but would require uh, mm -hmm. more calculations. OK. And um, so for instance, I mean, now we have of course, a modified an extended action. And uh, we also try to check how the correction to the Newtonian potential look like in this type of uh, oh, we theory. Are, we, um, we have not gone so far, no. Okay. Yeah, because we'd be interested to see what kind of uh, behavior in terms of, yeah. Okay, thank it's you very much. Yeah. Okay, more questions, please. Ah, I see a question from Alexei Koshlyf. Alexei, please ask your question. Ah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bianca, for your talk. Actually, I'm uh, like Luca. I'm about the same action. Actually, it's not even a question. Maybe I would comment a little bit from what I can understand from the section. Uh, I, I would say I disagree that you name it non-local because in a sense, it's local at the end of the day. Yeah. We well, in the end, yeah, I mean, I, can, I possibly agree with you because you have the mass terms. <laughs> uh, not only because of this, even if you put this mass to zero, it's totally fine because for H menu, you will just generate uh, the Lambertian squared from your while squared term. So uh -huh. you just, I would put it differently to my taste. I would put it like not, to, it, it's perfectly local. It's H menu, box H menu. Uh, but what you 
what how do I see it? You did motivate how you can put one over the Lambertian in front, and as such, technically you eliminate the problem of a ghost. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I totally agree also with what you commented to Luca. You will immediately lose renormalizability. So yeah, because, because normal, technically normalizable in the first place. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Yeah, because while squared, while squared was introduced as a renormalize as a, some mm-hmm. trick to renormalize theory by Stella. Mm-hmm. So in my opinion, you will just lose it. Well, unless you don't afraid it, it's okay. Um, but I would uh, be concerned about this. Yeah. Yeah, it, it depends on your viewpoint, you know. Um, of course, I'm coming from this from the, from this viewpoint. Or we have actually spin forms. That's the underlying theory, um, and we would compute the effects from from spin forms. Um, okay, okay. You you can treat I, I this would, as an effective action. So my comment would yeah, end up yeah. then at the stage that I would not name it non-local. It's perfectly local, really, even yeah, with okay, mass equal um, zero. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, so so yes, you technically cancel key to the force, making it key to key squared in the propagator, and you end up with just one single pole, uh, which is indeed ghost-free stuff. And uh, what I concur with you, it's very hard to motivate insertion of such operator generically. So maybe for yeah. me, the first time when I see it, uh, more or less, yeah, motiv- no, I, I motivated. It. You, you wouldn't come up with it from yeah. the effective field theory if you look for something renormalizable. We computed that from this non-perturbative framework, and we would rather look at this non-perturbative framework um, to, to apply renormalization or cross training and continuum limits there. Um, you know, so... I see. And actually, so, so this have, is the lowest order, you yeah. know, this is lowest order approximation. There will be, of course, higher order terms and so on. And so, um, yeah, uh, so, so to answer this yeah. question, well, I, I would not be concerned, or maybe I haven't thought it deeply enough yet, that this in, in itself is, is more divergent. <laughs> so, nice. at least, yeah, or is. Compared to 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 Stellis, where you have the ghost problem and so on and, and unitarity issues. Nice. Anyway, so we imagine that there will be also higher higher order terms. Yeah. Yes, and another question, maybe I missed this during your talk. Mm-hmm. So you're saying it's, it is a limit. So which scale determine determines for you this limit? Be, beyond um, or below which scale should I trust this as a limit? Yeah. So well. So, so uh, in fact, if you if you do this if you do this lattice expansion, um, you now we use the uh, this hypercubical lattice, yes. um, and it's the background expansion. We also have to choose a, a background length for the lattice length for the for the edge length, and okay. that is little lambda. So that's the background length. Um, so. So then, uh, what you get is well, you, you 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 compute the Hessian, and in fact, you know the issue is that whereas normally you have explicit discretized derivatives in the Ratchet action, there's no explicit der- derivatives, so it's a bit of an art to to identify them. The derivatives come always with relation to the lattice constant, uh, meaning you know the derivatives are represented by Fourier momenta. And so what, what you look is a limit in which these Fourier momenta are well, much larger than the, than the lattice constant. Um, and that's a continuum limit. Um, uh, so well, in the end, my, my, my lattice constant is a bit abstract uh, for me as an observer, for example, coming from the cosmological community. So what should I yeah, think yeah. of if I think uh, starting from your effective action from yeah, gravity no, no, and what what I'm saying is that the limit you you know the, the the expansion you compute in the lattice constant yes has to be seen to be valid for Fourier momenta which are much larger than the lattice constant. Um, I'm I'm saying that because in the end, if you want to take the the continuum limit, 
exactly people would say you sent it to be to zero um, yes. and and then basically the mass term I wrote you know so basically when I say Planck the, the degrees of freedom get very massive well that ma mass is also basically expressed in terms of the of this lattice length um, so that's how you can can consider the um, the limit in spin nice. forms we don't want to exactly send it to zero um, because, oh, some, something which I forgot to mention is we have these discrete areas which are uh, Planck length squared. So what we imagine is that, you know, in the end, the, the, the lattice length is of order Planck, Planck length. Ah, okay. So uh, maybe this is what I was asking. So you yeah. kind of having in mind that uh, lattice scale and Planck length is... Uh... Well, I mean, maybe, we, maybe they even match each other, or maybe comparable. Yeah. So, so you roughly, nice. you roughly ident identify that. Yeah. So. And maybe the last question from my side: Does it have any connection with uh, activity of Slava Muhanov and co-authors, where they consider discretized space-time? Well, uh, what kind of? I mean, the, the attempts to use discretized space-times, you know, they kind of go back. A long while to Reggie and so on. And there's quantum Reggie calculus, that's all the discretization of space time, and then you base a parts integral on that. And in fact, you know, what I presented is, is a spin forms based on the Plebansky action that's also based on discrete space time. Uh, the difference, you know, we have this additional tools of topological field series and getting some kind of exact quantization for these operators. So yes, they are all based on, on discretized space times. As far as I understood, uh, Slava uses uh, a kind of Palatini formulation. There's also yeah. earlier works which used lattice Palatini even from the seventies. Um, back then it was always difficult to put them on the computer and because of say the conformal factor problem, if you use a cleaning approaches, they didn't come far. <laughs> Um, so that's why, for instance, one reason spin forms uh, do not, in principle, have the conform effector problem um, because we use Lorentz. I mean, we use really the I action here. Um, but yeah, in the end, it's it's uh, discretized. It's it's discretized space time. Um, and here the claim is well, that there's an auxiliary discretization, which is a choice of triangulation. Um, but there's another more subtle discretization of the spectra of the area operators. And so we agree in the first place. And the second is the spectra of the operators. That's why, that's why, for instance, say we in the in the end, the lattice constant you know, could be identified with Planck lengths, because the, the discrete spectra, of course, are parameterized by the Planck lengths. I see. Thank you very much. Okay. More questions, please. I don't see more questions. Let, me ask, me ask. let me ask you uh, myself a question. Um, my question concerns some general uh, stuff. I would like to ask you, what is your opinion about summation on the different topology in spin form approach. My, my question is related with very well known problem with quantum gravity, because if you deal with dimension more than two, it means three dimension or four dimension, then it is very, it is impossible to describe summation of on different topology because classification uh, according to a well-known Markov theorem, it does not exist a classification of different topologies. So we cannot yeah. say, okay, let's perform summation on the old topology. For example, we can do this in two-dimensional case because in two-dimensional case, the classification on different topology means the classification by error characteristics. Yeah, so... What what do you think can help uh, spin uh, form approach somehow to solve this problem with topology? What do you think? Okay, so 
so well i i don't know how much i mean i could talk another hour about that but in general <laughs> um you know spin forms are already kind of quite complicated in itself and i always interpreted in in the philosophy of of a lattice lattice approach so i personally do not aim yet to sum over topologies mm -hmm. so um and um i really well i well i, I use a framework where to for instance define the the theory and to define the continuum limit uh, well we take a refinement limit and in this refinement limit we also hope to uh, avoid all these issues which you get by discretization namely that your your results depend on the choice of triangulation um on the choice on the choice of how you exactly discretize the action but also which triangulation you choose and so on and you hope to restore a notion of the femorphism invariance so actually i've worked previously before that work <laughs> i worked for 10 years on all these issues um and so that that does work in the context of Keeping the I mean, using a, a fixed triangulation, but in the end, you aim to refine the triangulation to take the continuum limit in this way. Um, there's also an alternative proposal, which is basically to sum over all triangulations. That includes a sum possibly over all topologies and even more. Um, and well, in fact, in itself, it seems all a, a bit unpractical for me to do. <laughs> That's why I first do a fixed triangulation. In fact, since indeed the computations we could do are, are very much limited. Um, but in general, there is actually a framework where you can do, where you can well, define the sum. It's a generalization to, to matrix, matrix theory. It's known as group field theory. And you will have Daniela Doriti speaking about that. So <laughs> he will tell you all about that. Um, then it's also a question how much you can there say about uh, the sum over topologies. There's a, a, a range of results. Um, mostly if, these, if you want to find some results, I mean, most in, in most cases, it's done in, a, in an Euclidean context. So at least the action or the signature you consider is Euclidean. Um, but the sum over topologies gets more interesting if you look at Lorentzian quantum signature. And in Lorentzian signatures, you know, there's, you can hope on, um, on a mechanism which at least suppresses uh, things like topology change. Um, and that's because Lorentzian, Lorentzian signature and topology change um, is not very uh, consistent with each other. So you usually violate your Lorentz, I mean, you usually cannot define a Lorentzian matrix at the point where this topology change happens. Um, but well, we found some indications, so that's very preliminary, which might provide an, a mechanism to suppress these topology changes. Uh, so topology change again is slightly different from sum over topologies. That's when the topology changes in your time evolution of your space. Mm -hmm. So okay. there's um, well, that's that's uh, that's first answers. So you are I completely agree that with your remarks that in four dimensions um, it seems very impossible to classify everything. Um, in group field theories, in particular in a version which is tensor field theory, where you get rid of, of, of groups, there's kind of one result which kind of shows similar to, to matrix theories where you find that plan, um, spherical topologies dominate. Uh, you have also a similar result that you find that a certain type of configurations, for some reason known as melonic configurations, dominate. Um, but then, you know, that is that in that case, you only look at, at these configurations. There's an issue, there's a question whether then the entire um, partition function actually describes something like a smooth space time, as far as I understood. That's actually not the case. It actually 
describes much more something like a polymeric phase, which is known also from dynamical triangulations. Um, but you can possibly hope on some kind of, of, of this mechanism that you find them again a mechanism where you see that a certain type of simple topology um, dominates and everything else is, is, is subdominant. Um, yeah, but in fact, it's, it's one of these issues of what you sum over and how you define your path in the grill. And in the end, you want to make always sure that you, know, you are not dominated by very wild configurations. Uh, and in fact, if you know, if the sum over topologies is already uncountable or unclassifiable, um, that is likely to happen if you do not find the result that a certain simple topologies will dominate. Okay, thank you. More questions, please. Thank you for your answer. More questions, please. If you can ask me another question. Okay, please yeah. ask. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's more a question about um, how to interpret uh, this action, uh, this, uh -huh. this move that you showed. Like, for instance, let's, so from what I understood, this action, this continuum limit of spin form, uh -huh. can somehow be used also to, to study low energy uh, physics of this mm -hmm. spin form approach, right? Yeah, somehow. I mean, the, this action is from this year, so we haven't done too much sure. yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you would expect that, I mean, in principle, you can study, I don't know, uh, some, um, let's say, low energy correction to uh, mm -hmm. GR, let's say. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So in principle, you could use it to falsify this spin form approach. Am I correct in this? You say I could use it to classify the spin to form falsify, To falsify, to falsify. Like to make somebody... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, actually, you know, my entire journey started with the attempt to falsify the spin form approach. <laughs> um, mm. But in fact, we found, you know, these surprising results, which, which is that we, um, well, first, that the flatness this, this flatness problem kind of is resolved. Um, and secondly, that even the continuum limit, you know, the area Regge action, which including me, nobody expected that in the limit, it actually gives GR, um, does give GR in, in the limit. So mm -hmm. if you're asking, okay, now we can go on, compute the kind of um, lowest order modification to GR, and then compare it with some experiments, of course, that would be the overall aim. Mm -hmm. uh, There's always a question to find uh, suitable experiments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but but this would be the over, overall aims, you know, but uh, okay. yeah, it's, you know, I haven't, we haven't checked yet because we, we recently got this, this action and it's kind of the first time I'm actually working in the continuum with continuum actions. So um, mm -hmm. kind of, yeah, I, I mean, we, we have not talked about what, what would be nice experiments which would maximally differentiate or uh, um, differentiate between this modification and other modification. But if you have ideas, we are very open for sort of suggestions. Okay, so, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. More questions, please? Yes. If no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Janka, for your interesting talk, very interesting talk. Please don't forget to send us your transparencies, okay? Thank you. Yeah. We can applaud. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye, Bianca. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Um, yeah.